là aussi euh, saluer et remercier de l'honneur l'amitié qu'elle nous fait d'avoir accepté notre invitation, le professeur Marie-Jean-Clic de, de New York. C'est euh, pour, dans le monde de la mythologie, une euh, personnalité extraordinaire, euh, presque boutique. Et elle a participé, elle était toute jeune, à, aux travaux de l'équipe pionnière, fonction fondatrice, avec euh, Vincent Doll et marie Nice Vander, euh, à la découverte des propriétés thérapeutiques euh, dans les éditions de la méthadone. What a pleasure it is to be in Biarritz. I have never been here before. I have been to THS three times in 95, 97, and 99 in the south of France. And I find that the meeting now has grown and matured to a very exciting one that balances science and clinical research with humanism and concern for the patient and concern for society as a whole. I do not wish to put down the early days of THS when this organization was new and I came to the second, third, and fourth meeting. It was unbelievably courageous. France had only recently accepted the concept of pharmacotherapy to be combined with behavioral treatment for addictions. Methadone and buprenorphine had just been introduced in the early 1990s after many discussions about this. And the concept of putting together both physicians and others concerned about treatment of addiction with those concerned about treatment of hepatitis, primarily C but also B and Delta and HIV was extraordinarily courageous and very important. Our job is not done. We have possibly the most stigmatized of all the disorders, the addictions, grouped together with possibly the third most stigmatized, AIDS. And hepatitis would be stigmatized if the world truly understood that most of our patients were sometimes drug users, not necessarily addicted, but drug users. But they were. And we know that the epidemiology of hepatitis C, and to a lesser extent, the hepatology, the uh, epidemiology of HIV are involving intravenous drug use, as well as cocaine use and other drugs of abuse, which change behaviors and or actually offer parental introduction of virus, critical for C. So I think the meeting is, is extremely fine. I would share with you tonight some of the early facts about treatment. Vincent Dole was a metabolism expert at the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research. He did volunteer work on the Health Research Council of the City of New York. And they identified that the number one problem in New York area, not being addressed and not being carried out with research was heroin addiction. And in the summer and autumn of 1963, Professor Dole decided to change his laboratory from studies of metabolism and hypertension to look for a new approach, a pharmacologic approach for treatment of addiction. <laughs> and with the permission of the president, Deb Bronk, and the head of the hospital, Dr. Macklin McCarty, one of the original discoverers of DNA, he changed his work and the name of his laboratory. <clears throat> and he recruited two new staff members. Now this is a piece of history that is not well known. Uh, I didn't join the team of Dole and Nicewander. Nicewander and I joined Professor Dole. We were both recruited in the autumn of 1963. Marie was a psychiatrist who had been working both on the streets of New York, the hospitals of New York, and had spent some time working at the United States Public Health Service Hospital in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, she worked there, but was 
disappointed because they were not looking to treat addiction. They were looking at Lexington to develop a non-addicting pain medication. She came back to New York, wrote a book, which was entitled The Addict as a Patient, <clears throat> which I commend to you all. And Vitz read that book and asked to meet her, met her, interviewed her, recruited her, and two years later married her. I was across the street at Cornell, New York Hospital. Vince wanted very much to have two young people work with him on his team, in addition to a psychiatrist, Marie, who knew something about addiction. The chairman of medicine said he couldn't allow two people to go, but he would allow one, and all of the house staff wanted to go to do research at the Rockefeller University. To be very honest, I'm not sure we even understood what the topic would be, but we all decided that we would like to be there. Vince Stoll interviewed each one of us and selected two, and the chairman of medicine selected me because I was a woman, the only woman on the house staff back then, and I would not be drafted. Now this actually is an archival picture, and many of the comments and slides I'm presenting you today, I presented a year ago at a much sadder presentation. It was the memorial for Professor Dole, who had died a year before that. But this is Vince, Marie, and myself in 64. And I think in retrospect, probably the most important thing we did at that time was to change the whole concept of addiction. Change it to formulating the idea that addiction is a disease, a metabolic disease of the brain, but causing drug hunger, drug craving, and drug self-administration. And that addiction was not simply a criminal behavior or weak personality disorder. Although there could be comorbid conditions, it was driven by the drug interacting with the brain and changing the brain, our early hypothesis. And the early chronology of our research began in January of 1964, conducted at the Rockefeller Hospital, and in the first six months, we actually had a proof of concept, that is, that one could use a pharmacotherapy with a, what we guessed was an opioid receptor directed, but didn't know then because opiate receptors had not been identified and were not to be definitively until 1973. But we wanted a medication directed at the same place morphine went, then heroin went, and we called that the opiate receptor. And we wanted a medication that would be orally effective, so there would no needles required, and it would have a long duration of action. At that time, methadone had been studied by two sets of groups. One were pain studies carried out by Beecher up at Harvard and Hood at Memorial. And they had both intriguingly found that if methadone, which had been brought back by the US military from Germany, made by the Bayer Aspirin Company, when they studied it in opiate naive, opiate naive individuals, they found that pain relief occurred for only six hours. But if they gave three or four doses a day, like you would with morphine, respiratory depression would occur in the opiate naive individual. And then, and now this many years later, I will say that I think our FDA and every FDA equivalent should say never give methadone to an opiate naive individual. Give it to persons that have experienced opiates either for management of pain or for the treatment of addiction. Not to be discussed at this meeting, but evolving in many countries, including US, methadone has become the drug of choice for management of chronic pain because it allows persons to have a normal lifestyle to think clearly, to perform clearly, and yet have excellent pain relief. And you can add short-acting opiates to add additional pain relief when necessary. 
brain is changed by short-acting opiates on off. And this is why we now taught pain doctors to use sustained release medications or methadone or buprenorphine, which have long-acting properties, and not morphine on and off for the most of chronic pain management. Because on-off effects acting at receptors disrupt molecular biology, neurotransmitters, and behavior. Same with cocaine, same with alcohol. Steady state, sustained release is essential to allow normalization of many functions. The other group that had studied methadone, but only to rapidly detoxify people, was the Lexington group, who gave methadone two to four times a day, usually four times a day, but often in centers reduced down to three or even two, and had given it only over a seven to 10 day period with the idea that it must be short acting, that their goal was to get people off the opiate. Well, the first work was done in our hospital. We recruited people from releasees from prison, people that had finished prison, finished parole. Our patients had a mean of 14 years of addiction history. Addiction we defined as multiple daily self-administrations of the opiate, primarily heroin, every day for at least four years. Later, we were to back off to three years and later yet to one year. We would like to see that be reduced to six months or three months. It has not been any place in the United States or Europe. We also know in US, and I know it's true here in France, Methadone is overregulated. You heard me ask questions about medical maintenance. Mm -hmm. Well, it really doesn't exist in any country except US, and now Sweden. I was able to introduce it in Sweden. But after whatever the tolerance of acceptance is, once patients do well in methadone, then they may progress to medical maintenance, where the methadone is prescribed by either a general physician or a psychiatrist, mm -hmm or a specialist in internal medicine. But the patient must come to a methadone clinic initially, and they must be attached to a methadone clinic in case problems arise. Now, when we developed that concept in 1984, we put very tough limits. We said they had to be in methadone treatment for five years. That's absurdly long. And now the criteria in most places is one year of successful performance. But even that is too great unless you have really fine methadone programs. Many of ours are, but some certainly aren't. And in France, I've been to some superior methadone programs, and I've been to some that are not so great, just like US. So I think in France and in US, we need to do two things. We have to decrease, not deregulate, but decrease the regulations on methadone to allow progression, change the fact that you had to have one whole year of multiple daily self-injections of heroin to get into methadone treatment. That also is too long. The concept of daily multiple injections is very sound. That should be the criteria for methadone or buprenorphine, not just DSM-4 criteria, which do not require a biological change, no dependence, no tolerance. Something in between is necessary for both. I think we should have equal access to methadone or buprenorphine. For induction, you would choose whichever would seem to be better. Somebody with a low degree of tolerance, fewer years of addiction, I would probably start with buprenorphine because you can move seamlessly onto methadone. And whenever I say buprenorphine, I mean buprenorphine naloxone, never buprenorphine alone. And then one can uh, uh, choose for people to start methadone, those that have years of addiction, using very high amounts of heroin or other short-acting opiate, and they will do better. So the first work done at Rockefeller, and the second study was done as translational work one year later, but published earlier because of a reason I will tell you. The original work was done in 64, in six months, and Professor Dole wanted very much to present it as an exciting new finding at the most prestigious of the United States organizations for medical research, the Association of American Physicians, or Old Turks, as we lovingly call it. Then, 
an organization of honorific type for men only, subsequently admitting women, and yes, I am now an old Turk. Now, we looked at heroin addicts on the street, we brought them into the ward of the hospital, and what we found, we show in this cartoon. Heroin addicts use heroin three to six times every day, as you see here with the peaks and valleys. If they don't use heroin, they will go into withdrawal. If they take too much, they may have an opiate overdose. We started the methadone dosing based on what Hood and Beecher had taught. We had the opposite goal, so we started with the 20 to 40 milligrams, which had been shown by Beecher and Hood to be safe in opiate naive individuals, but then raise the dose slowly. And it was my obligation amongst many other things to observe the patients and see when they could have the next dose and have the next dose escalation. So we started giving two doses a day and by the end of the first month, I talked Vince into letting me give it one time a day, building on the work of Hood and Beecher, and giving it one time a day with 10 milligrams increase per week until we reached dose of 80 to 120 milligrams. And when we did that, we saw persons that were not high or euphoric and not in opiate withdrawal, but in fact, completely normal. And yet studies beginning in our studies in 1964 have shown that the majority of heroin addicts need 80 to 150 milligrams a day of methadone. So the buprenorphine isn't really quite adequate because we do know that the top dose of buprenorphine naloxone or buprenorphine alone that can be used with increasing effects in humans is 32 mg sublingually. That's equivalent, and many studies have shown this, to about 70 milligrams of methadone. And some people are accepting that lower than adequate to be able not to have to go to clinic every day. We then conducted two sets of studies, each four weeks long, in a double-blinded Latin square design, in which we superimposed a short-acting opiate, such as heroin, denoted with this H, against the background of daily oral methadone. And what we found in the first study was that no one had a euphoric effect or a high. We then did a second four-week set of studies, same design, Latin square, double-blinded. And what we learned again was people could not feel heroin or dihydromorphone or morphine. Morphine caused pins and needles, but nothing else. Heroin itself or saline. We then did a third set of studies, and they are shown here. We superimposed against this background now of increasing doses and increasing duration of time, as you will see in the balloons, 20, 40, and 150 days of treatment. We superimposed up to 160 milligrams of pure Justice Department supplied heroin against the background of methadone and found that once dose had been increased to that 80 to 120 and time had elapsed, cross tolerance occurred so that one could not perceive or become euphoric from the superimposed opiate. These studies accomplished two things. They let us know that the former heroin addict, now in early methadone treatment, would not kill themselves if they would go out from the clinic and superimpose a short-acting opiate. Further, they taught us the mechanism, which we had hypothesized but had not evidence for at the beginning, that is, cross-tolerance. Now, when that first presentation was made, we couldn't submit the data by early December of 64 because we hadn't finished going over all the data. So we had to wait one year early December 65, to present the work at the May 66 meeting. And that's why the first research is the second paper. We had some excellent questions, and those of you working in treatment get the same questions today. 
Will your patient have an overdose if they should take heroin? No, I've already told you the answer. What will methadone do to the liver? Well, I started prospective studies in 64 to address that question, despite the fact we discovered the very high prevalence then of Hep B, later Hepatitis Delta, and now Hepatitis C, we learned that persons without liver disease sustain no liver damage due to methadone. And how would these patients respond to pain? Well, they feel pain, they have pain, and they need to have medication for pain, usually a short-acting opiate superimposed. The next question, the one that I get so tired of hearing, came from a professor at UPenn, Isaac Starr, who said, and when do you plan to withdraw them from methadone? And Professor Dole simply said, and when do you plan to withdraw your diabetics from insulin? Or I could add your hypertensives from their needed medication, or your depressed patients from their needed medication. The answer is, when you, the physician, and the patient feels they're ready, with the possibility that you will have to reinstitute treatment. Now, for most persons with addiction, we know it's a chronic disease, and if you do not continue treatment, it is a chronic relapsing disease. This is not to say that everyone needs to stay in treatment. In the United States, however, we had a terrible episode in the late 70s where it was mandated that everyone come off methadone treatment. And the same would be true with buprenorphine. Well, 80% relapsed to illicit drug use within a year. 80%. And those who were able to stay abstinent usually were not truly abstinent. They started to use alcohol heavily, or benzodiazepines, or some illicit drug of society. When somebody asks the question of when they're going to come off methadone or come off buprenorphine, mm. I will look at them very intently and say, why did you ask that question? <laughs> what problem do you have with treating addiction? And you can watch people start to squirm because then it all rolls out, be they a physician or a policymaker. Mm -hmm. You can take them down the line of, it costs to treat, ah, how much does it cost to go to prison? Mm -hmm. How much does it cost to treat AIDS mm -hmm. or have C or have a liver transplant? It costs to treat an addiction, nothing compared with societal costs, mm -hmm. healthcare and otherwise. You don't want to treat them because you think the medication is evil, the medication Good for chronic pain, evil for treatment of addiction. So what you're saying is you don't think addiction is a disease, and we come back to that. Mm. And remember our hypothesis of 64, that now is well proven that addictions mm. are diseases mm. of the brain with persistent and measurable changes in the brain. We didn't have the way to measure them, and we do now, and we do mm. it. You know, these are not fantasies or personality mm. disorders or criminal behaviors, but that needs to be taught, and it needs to be taught head on. I would start in every medical school, law school, nursing school, and social work school. Mm. Policymakers are funny worldwide. I have learned they do what they think their constituency wants them to do. Mm. They actually are very, very dependent mm. on mm. their constituency ideology. Mm. So once you can reach a policymaker who's really got strength, like the late Senator Kennedy, mm. whom I had the honor to know and interact with and help as he introduced parity mm. for treatment of addiction and mental health. Mm. Then you have a courageous person who will get up and say, what do you mean addictions aren't diseases? But it takes education. Vince used a word here which I've always been unhappy about. He used the word substitute therapy. And here in France, and I don't speak French, I keep saying, ce n'est pas substitution, c'est replacement. Replacement, ce n'est pas substitution. And this is an important concept which we now have proof in humans as well as animals. A relative endorphin deficiency develops. Finally, Dr. Stead, very well known professor from Duke, said, And how much does it cost? And Vince said, 15 cents for the methadone. Well, it's now 35 cents a day in US and about 350 for the total package. Well, sadly, that's gone up to about $15, but 35 and 15, not too bad. Now, the research 
was so exciting that we decided that it needed to be taken to the field. A word that's popular in the US today, at least, is translational research. So the late Marie Nicewander led the pack. She went down to the Manhattan General Hospital, which then was a proprietary hospital and later became part of the Bernstein Institute of Beth Israel. And with several, including Joyce Lowenson, she conducted a study. She first did a follow-up, which of the patients that we had admitted to Rockefeller and which we were all following up at Rockefeller, that's the first six subjects you see over the line. Six, you say, this will shock you, but our original research in 64 was accomplished with eight subjects. And three quarters of them, 75%, were still in treatment one year later. Marie admitted those below the line at the Manhattan General Hospital, and she had an opportunity to follow those only for one up to three months at the time this paper was written. But what she proved was what had happened in our very beautiful campus at the Rockefeller University with flowers and caring staff could be recapitulated in a very crowded, rude, noisy urban environment, a critical proof of principal extension. And in that uh, work, uh, we uh, had also initiated prospective studies, which was my responsibility, to look at liver disease. And we found, as I've already told you, no problem with hepatotoxicity. But you can see that when we reported this study almost 10 years after people had been admitted, there was a very high retention. We find that this group of persons on moderately high, 80 to 120 for the most part, milligrams of methadone a day, who were in treatment for five years before they went in to medical maintenance under a practitioner, that about five to 10% of those ultimately decide they would like to see if they still need medication. And they are tapered very slowly off. And that group has essentially a 100% ability to stay abstinent. Now we are beginning to ask the question, are they genetically different? Does the brain heal with time? I suspect the brain does heal. And we've been able to prove that functions which are modulated normally by our endorphin system become terribly disrupted during heroin addiction and become normalized at different rates of time, but normalized during methadone treatment. In our rodent studies, we were able to show normalization with time, with no treatment after opiates or cocaine, but it takes much, much longer for the brain to normalize in these little rats and mice than it does to have caused the problem. So in humans, we might be talking about five or 10 or 15 years, and not just an abstinence one year in a residential community. And we know the when residential communities finally in many countries were talked into with pressure often to do follow-up studies, they too found that 80% of their opiate addicts would relapse. And this has made many centers, even those that are originally committed to abstinence-based treatment, refer their patients to methadone or buprenorphine treatment off-site while they're undergoing counseling in a residential community. So I think the bottom line is for most probably lifelong very long-term treatment. For some, may be able to come off and do very well. But the most tragic thing, and we did it to young people in the 70s, when we saw young people under 21 with years of heroin addiction come into treatment at age 15, 16, we thought surely they can come off sooner because their brain can't possibly be as badly altered. And parenthetically, we now know from our rodent studies, the adolescent exposed is much worse off than the adult exposed, much worse, with more persistence. But we didn't know that then. So we would taper these young people after a year or two of methadone treatment. This was late 70s, early 80s. What did we see? We saw them come to clinic in a medication-free state, which we recommended, demanded. But then they would stop coming, and that was always a bad sign. When they would stop coming, it usually meant that they had relapsed and were embarrassed and didn't want to come back and see us. 
And then maybe a year, two years later, they had felt so comfortable in the clinic, they would come back and say, help me, I've relapsed. But what was going on in the late 70s and the early 80s? The beginning, yet unidentified, AIDS epidemic. And these people, these young people, would develop AIDS in huge numbers. And the next paper we reported was showing something that is terribly important. Again, a prospective study of the first 214 patients admitted to Rockefeller, admitted to what then was to become the Bernstein Institute of Beth Israel, to St. Luke's Hospital, part of Columbia, and two other locations, Harlem Hospital and the Roosevelt Hospital, each of which had started treatment programs, small treatment programs under our direction. We also were able to carry out a one point in time study in 1970 to 73 of 1,435 patients in methadone treatment. We found that constipation, a major problem, goes away in three years. Ultimately, the textbooks of pharmacology were changed to say that tolerance develops slowly, but it develops. All the other changes were those commonly seen with opiates and tolerance developed with time, except in small percentages which in fact reflect the normal population medical problems in US. The only problem that was noted and which continued to persist was increased perspiration or sweating, but we found that that did not impair performance even in the hot sun. We also went on to develop methods to measure methadone levels. Now, I didn't mention it, but in 1964, there was no radio amino assay, there was no mass spectrometry, there was no technique to measure levels of anything. Independently working at Cornell, Chuck and Teresi, now part of my NIDA Research Center, and myself at Rockefeller, developed gas liquid chromatographic methods to measure methadone, and we were able to do so and find that the racemic mixture has a half-life of about 24 hours. We did develop some alternative dose forms. One of those dose forms was methadone to which we had added naloxone. That's reminiscent of the buprenorphine naloxone from today. And in fact, I took the idea that we had used in 70 up to John Lewis at Reckitt Coleman and suggested he add naloxone to buprenorphine, which he did, and it's one of the two forms and the major form that we recommend in U.S. at this time. What do you, do, what do you believe uh, about the evolution of the uh, drug addiction treatment in France? Because we are maybe the alone country who have uh, methadone treatment, but uh, uh, more buprenorphine treatment than the methadone. But without, at the moment, without the suboxone, because uh, we have a debate in France some people told it's not different uh, injecting uh, Subotex and uh, Suboxone. <laughs> well, I think we know that simply isn't the case. There have been two or three published studies. Mm -hmm. However, some had the expectation that adding naloxone to buprenorphine would prevent all of the buprenorphine's effects. No. When we were afraid that methadone would be abused parentally, and we in fact published paper, which you probably have read, mm -hmm. on plausible levels of methadone after methadone alone or methadone buprenorphine, mm -hmm. uh, bupre, uh, naloxone. Mm -hmm. And we showed in the naloxone methadone paper that the naloxone in no way took away from the beneficial effects of methadone. Why? Naloxone is rapidly metabolized by the liver in the first passage through the liver. And when you use naloxone in an overdose situation, mm. you have to intravenously inject it. Mm. So we knew that naloxone methadone mm. did not detract from the methadone effects, mm. but would block any high from intravenous methadone. We were soon to learn that methadone is an extraordinarily boring drug. If it's injected, it binds to plasma proteins, and people given it on a blinded basis don't feel it at all. Methadone reaches the brain very slowly, even after intravenous administration, 
that the abuse of methadone, which pertained before we started our treatment research and still pertains in a small but real number, was never by the intravenous use in US. It was always oral. And in fact, it was used not to get high, but to prevent going into withdrawal while heroin was being sought or after our research became well known to self-maintain. Buprenorphine, not so. If it's injected, one does get a high. But if one puts in naloxone, but it blocks the first 15 to 30 minutes, the high. It doesn't block the effects after that, but it blocks that first period. It has zero downside, zero unfortunate effects when given sublingually, which is the intended route of administration. I actually know of no instance where one should use buprenorphine naloxone and just do away with buprenorphine alone. One gets away with the abuse liability, but doesn't deter in any way the effectiveness. And these are the plasma levels of methadone uh, at the first eight hours and then the lower curve between 20 and 24 hours after the last dose. And you see on the left the pictures I showed you from our earliest paper. And on the right, a pharmacokinetic summary from my lab and that from Interisi. We know that heroin has a half-life of three minutes. Heroin is a prodrug, also developed by Bayer. Uh, it is transformed almost immediately to 6-acetylmorphine, which is the first species that binds to the mu opioid receptor, which we now know. In contrast, methadone, orally available, has a 24-hour half-life for the racemic, and doing stable isotope studies, the Wilkes-Bach technique for putting tritium, a radio label, onto compounds, well, we didn't get very high specific activity, and as you see here, Vince working with a grad student could not show any significant difference. But it was the approach of using separately labeled enantiomers that led three years after this initial paper, Simon, Snyder, and Terranius to discover the specific opiate receptor in March 1973. So in 1973, Vince became so concerned, this sounds familiar too, doesn't it, about the failure of society and especially physicians, especially physicians, to accept methadone maintenance treatment. He thought he might leave the university. The most incredible need in our treatment establishment, frankly, is training physicians. They are the most biased, the most tied up in knots with their stigma, the most afraid of persons with addiction. They don't want them. They want to send them elsewhere. And it doesn't matter whether you're a psychiatrist, mm -hmm. an internist, or what. The great majority of all physicians mm -hmm. want the addict to go elsewhere. They want the alcoholic to go elsewhere. They're happy to take care of George, but they really don't want to know that George drinks two bottles of vodka a day. Mm. And the same is true with the illicit drugs. So we have to educate our peers, mm. our peers in medicine. And therefore he allowed me, nurtured me, to be, had developed a separate lab that was physically separate, financially separate, geographically independent, several buildings away. I had one year to get all of my funding, and it was not a whole lot easier in 74 than it is now in 2009. And Vince decided two years later not to leave addiction entirely, not to leave science, but to move to another building, the opposite end of campus, and start research in alcoholism in rodent models and he never conducted any more research of any type in opiate addiction, but devoted his life of research until 1990 in studies of alcoholism. And I'll share with you, we had humanism highlighted in the first several discussions. This is a paint-by-number picture. Uh, we had occupational therapy work with our patients, along with social workers, and in our first eight subjects, most of them had not finished high school. They had no education. 
This young man, Jack, did the paint by number picture and in June of 1964 gave it to me and simply wrote on the back an inscription, which is very meaningful to me from that point onward, thanking us for our work. I got an email from his widow. He died of lung cancer a couple of years ago, and his widow emailed me just one year ago. And she reintroduced herself. I had actually never met her. I had communicated with her once before and told me about her son who helped us after 9-11 in New York. And she thanked me, along with the late Marie Nyslander, for helping her husband. So over the span of time of 44 years, the memories went on and on. So if I were doing the best of all possible worlds, anybody with daily multiple use of a short acting opiate would come into a treatment program that would be nice. That means wall painted, caring staff, and a receptionist that says, hi Johnny, how are you? And not, you junkie. Mm. And I would have a physician who would see each patient. Intermittently, not daily, but intermittently, certainly do an evaluation of their medical and psychiatric status. And I would have counselors available who would contact, and probably groups. And then I would see what services are needed for which patient, start them on treatment, increase their dose, if they start with buprenorphine and it's not adequate. And I'm happy to say my university that was not always absolutely excited about studies related to addiction, not excited at all, but tolerant, but by, 19, by 2001, for our centennial, they chose addiction as actually one of the most major areas that the university has contributed to, to, and I put together this centennial symposium. And then just last year, the university had an all-day party for me, which they do if you're going to continue to work, and I certainly am for at least 10, 20, who knows, years to come. <laughs> and they had a symposium for me where I had my former trainees do presentations, followed by a dinner party and one outside speaker who was Dr. Nora Volkov, whom you've heard about from NIDA. And I think the most meaningful possibly for a field that still is not adored by everyone. And I have fought the battles with Mayor Giuliani and Charlie Rangel and Mr. Senator McCain. If we can get better communications, mm. then we get amplification. Working through the New York Times, I was able to educate our mayor, a very famous man mm. then and now, mm. and have him change 180 degrees, understand treatment, and actually increase the financing for treatment. Their working through the mass media was of critical importance. Also of importance was the fact I didn't say, oh, he's stupid or he was an idiot. I know he wasn't, he was a brilliant man. <laughs> Tough, but brilliant. But I had to say, he hasn't had the right advisors. He needs to talk to experts that know about the field. Let us help him. I gave more lectures through the New York Times than I would like to think. And I really come back to, if anyone says they've never known a person with addiction, their family certainly doesn't have it, look at them and say, oh please, or were you adopted and you don't know your biological family? <laughs> when I first discovered the AIDS epidemic and IVDUs in 1983-84, working with Don Desjardins and the CDC, because I had the only bank of Sierra that could be looked at, People were not excited in Washington or even Geneva when I told them about AIDS. They said, no, no, it's just you people in New York that have heroin addiction or will have AIDS. So we now ask our question, isn't it immoral to make somebody come off of treatment when we know that they have a high risk of getting AIDS or if they don't already have it, hepatitis C? Isn't it unethical to take them away from being productive citizens, able to be a family person again, have a mother, a child, a husband, whatever? Isn't it unethical to take them away from learning, from going to school, 
And why? Because society thinks treatment is evil. <laughs> parce que, euh, brusquement, j'avais fait un petit article pour expliquer l'effet de la méthadone dans un journal de, de, de Genève, et euh, la semaine suivante, les... il y avait plein d'affiches dans la ville, avec un bord noir, c'était marqué « la méthadone est un stupéfiant qui tue mm ». -hmm. Au même moment, aux États-Unis, on avait des affiches, on voyait un, un couple souriant tenant un enfant dans la main sur un fond de cerisier en fleurs, où c'était marqué « la méthadone harmonise la vie ». Et c'était une période très difficile, parce que si on avait pu me mettre en prison, on l'aurait fait. Euh, tellement euh, mes collègues étaient jaloux, on était le, le dealer en blouse blanche. Et j'ai compris à ce moment-là que tout le malentendu était lié au fait que les gens étaient persuadés que la méthadone était comme l'héroïne, c'est-à-dire une drogue de plaisir en Europe, c'était vraiment la guerre. J'ai dû soutenir un médecin belge qui, parce que dans sa clientèle, il y a eu une overdose, il a été mis en prison, du reste dans la cellule avec les, les cétoxicomanes, hein, euh, et c'était à Bruxelles un grand débat, il ne faut pas mettre les, les médecins en prison, euh, et il a fallu tout le courage de... Marc Reisinger et Picard pour aller contre l'ordre des médecins, n'est-ce pas, qui, qui interdisait en Belgique l'utilisation de la méthode pour faire changer les choses. Mais il a fallu, il a fallu des années et des années euh, de, de, de combat. Alors, bon, nous, on, on, avait, on avait de succès en succès, on, a toujours eu, on était sur le bon cheval. Donc c'était évidemment pour nous relativement confortable, mais c'était désagréable de sentir cette hostilité générale. Et alors qui s'est progressivement estompé, mais il a fallu presque 20 ans, au moment où les travailleurs sociaux, les éducateurs, les collègues, voyant des toxicomanes sous traitement de méthadone aller bien, se sont dit « mais finalement, ce n'est pas si mal que ça ». Et il a fallu des années pour que finalement il y ait un accord relativement unanime sur ces traitements de, de substitution. Mais je, je crois que ce, ce malentendu... Euh, sur cette drogue de plaisir euh, était dès le départ. Et quand les gens ont compris que ce pouvait être comme un antidépresseur, presque en quelque sorte, s'il n'y si avait pas de polytoxicomanie associée, eh bien tout de suite le débat était plus clair. Et je me souviens être intervenu à, à Bayonne il y a combien d'années de ça enfin, Voilà, au moment où, où de nouveau il y avait un conflit local avec <rire> des articles de journaux contradictoires, c'était le même problème. Bon. Et on est venu faire une conférence avec Marc Heidinger, on avait expliqué ce que c'était que la méthadone, que ça ne faisait pas de plaisir particulier, que les gens étaient stables et tout, et après ça avait été plus facile. Alors vous voyez, en fait, disons, pour tous ceux qui, qui commencent maintenant, où les choses vont être totalement allées de soi, eh bien, euh, il a fallu des années et des années pour arriver un peu à ce, cet état d'acceptation. Je vais faire un petit témoignage hein, pour dire que, effectivement, euh, le dogme en France, c'était euh, on ne remplace pas une drogue par une autre. Et simplement, j'avais travaillé à New York et j'avais vu euh, l'efficacité euh, formidable qu'a décrite Marie, Marie Jean, euh, mais aussi j'avais vu quelque chose et, euh, qui était surprenant, c'est que sous méthadone, les patients éliminaient leur virus hépatique. Puisque moi, je faisais de la virologie de l'hépatite B, c'était les débuts de l'hépatite B. Donc, j'étais absolument fasciné par ça. Et j'ai essayé, tout bêtement, de demander une autorisation de méthadone pour traiter, selon un protocole, dix malades, avec qui, pour leur donner des antiviraux, parce qu'on avait bien conscience que s'ils n'étaient pas un peu stabilisés, on n'arriverait pas à leur donner correctement un antiviral. Et bien là, c'était tout à fait spectaculaire. D'abord, je suis passé en conseil de guerre deux, trois fois, et je dois dire que j'ai craqué. Après, même au ministère, j'ai été convoqué au ministère, où là, on m'a raconté des histoires extraordinaires, mais 
fallait vraiment, euh, c'était stupéfiant. On me disait, de toute façon, aux États-Unis, c'était une histoire de Nixon, ça ne se fait plus. Alors, il faut, faut voir quand même, les autorités sanitaires de la France me racontant avec deux, trois personnalités euh, que ça ne se faisait plus, que ça n'existait pas, alors que forcément le téléphone existant et que je continuais à avoir des liens avec les États-Unis, je savais très bien que c'était complètement faux. Il y a une espèce d'intimidation. Trepo a mentionné l'époque de Nixon et j'étais jeune médecin dans le marin américain dans cette époque et nous avons dans cette époque les soldats américains qui étaient dépendants sur l'héroïne qui était une espèce de produit de guerre qui était très efficace parce que c'était presque gratuit donné par le Viet Cong. Et nous avons eu un grand nombre d'Américains qui étaient dépendants et c'était Nixon qui était très concerné par ça et il a commandé, il avait commencé les, les, les Clinique de mettre de partout dans les années 70, 71, 72. Et c'était euh, dans cette époque que j'ai commencé et je m'en profitais par les recherches de euh, le professeur Creek et Dole et Nisswander. Euh, parce que, comme vous avez dit, c'était un traitement déjà établi, mais c'était impossible, à mon avis, de faire les le cliniques très répandues sans l'ordre du président. Euh, et c'était une, une telle urgence dans cette époque. Et, et c'était bien pour euh, le commencement du système partout dans le, le pays. Et euh, je peux dire un mot concernant euh, le système en Europe parce que presque chaque fois j'ai rendu visite en France, euh, j'ai vu des articles dans les journaux par les gens qui sont contre la méthodone, qui disent euh, euh, les choses euh, ridicules, que, que la méthodone est un médicament qui tue et sont interdits aux États-Unis parce qu'il y a chaque année les milliers de gens qui sont euh, tués par le surdosage de la méthodone. C'est complètement faux. Euh, la méthodone n'est pas un médicament dangereux. Euh, et, et aussi, euh, je dois dire qu'avec euh, la buprenorphine, la France est devenue un modèle pour l'Amérique parce que le, le système de euh, euh, buprenorphine par les médecins, médecins généralistes ici en France est complètement supérieur que le système en Amérique. Et j'espère que quelques jours, on peut Uh, achever le même niveau que vous avez ici en France où uh, l'addiction uh, soit pour les, uh, les, les médecins journalistes est comme une autre maladie chronique, uh, ce n'est pas un, uh, un système ou une maladie criminelle. Et maintenant, uh, à mon avis, le, la méthodon reste un médicament surcontrôlé. C'est très difficile d'utiliser. Il y a des pharmacies qui, qui refusent de vendre la méthodone en Amérique. Même j'ai créé une ordonnance pour ça. Parce que c'est aussi, à part de l'addiction, la méthodone est un très bon médicament pour la douleur. Et, mais euh, souvent, euh, les patients avec douleur qui répondent très bien à la méthodone, mais le pharmacien, pense que le patient est un addict euh, euh, parce qu'il prend la méthadone et c'est complètement faux parce que la méthadone est très bien pour la douleur. Euh, donc nous sommes tous euh, reconnaissants euh, au professeur Creek et ses collègues euh, dans les années 60 qui a commencé ce traitement et euh, je pense que la buprenorphine est aussi efficace, mais c'était le travail qui était le pionnier de, de uh, Professeur Creek et, uh, et d'autres qui uh, 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 
et, et les, les patients, et maintenant nous, les, les médecins sont de très reconnaissants euh, au, euh, au, au travail de professeur Craig. Merci beaucoup. We have to teach society that addictions are diseases, and I use the word addictions, not dependence. Dependence is a way to hide. Many, many drugs, many medications cause dependence. Addiction is a disease. There are several kinds of addiction, like there are several types of schizophrenia or depression or hypertension. We need to treat these diseases with the best tools we have. I wish we had pharmacologic tools to treat cocaine addiction. We do not. We're all working on that. We have some modest tools, and my lab, by discovering a functional variant of the mu receptor, was able to suggest that maybe alcoholics with that variant would do better. In okay, shouldn't we get all alcoholics with that gene variant into treatment immediately? Well, yes, we should, but we're still fighting stigma about treating the alcoholic with naltrexone, and then stigma about addictions in general, and then pharmaceutical companies being a little concerned that they don't want to just sell a medication to a person with a gene variant. But we have to change the thought processes that lead to all three of those. Medicine in the future is going to be individual genetics based. We have to face that, accept it, relish the thought of getting medications that work and avoiding those that have adverse effects. Number two, we have to teach policymakers what every family essentially knows. Almost every family has at least some place in its constellation an alcoholic. They don't talk about Uncle Johnny or Aunt Susie. They're kind of hidden over there. They drink too much, whatever. But if we come to grips with the reality of addictions and know that yes, there's addictions to illicit drugs and illicit drugs, it really doesn't make a whole lot of difference. The bottom line is the brain changes and those changes, and we must teach this, the changes are persistent. They do not go away easily, if at all. They may go away ultimately, but you cannot have somebody in a residential treatment facility for five or 10 years while you're waiting for the brain to normalize. And in prison, what do we know? We know that people are not drug free or abstinent. They're using drugs in prison. So it's fanciful to think you put them away in jail and they're drug free, not. So I think society needs to wake up to the incredible, even if they don't care about patients, the incredible cost to society of having a large group of people that can't work, can't go to school, can't function, and frequently have criminal behaviors. So if you're good-hearted and a physician and caring human being, you want to treat people if you have a treatment that works. If you're totally mean-spirited, but you look at dollars and cents on the ledger, you want to treat people because you save money. For a year and a half, this little poster was in the middle of York Avenue. And I think it tells all of our story and tells our university's great commitment to continuing research in the addictive area. Thank you.